Today is the 8th of June 2007 and I have the privilege of interviewing Charles Edwards who was a member of the 2nd, 2nd 19th Battalion uh, and uh, he was captured during the battle for Singapore but actually up on the Malayan uh, mainland and uh, he uh, was a prisoner of war in, in uh, Purdue jail, Kuala Lumpur then Singapore, then up on the Burma-Thailand Railway, and ultimately he went through to Japan. We will now cross to Charles to hear his story in his own words. Charles, thank you very much for agreeing to do this interview today, and also thank you for the support you give me uh, in trying to tell the story of some of the POW experiences. Would you like to start by just telling us briefly where you were born and you're educated and right up to the point when you enlisted into the AIF? Uh, well, I was born in Tintaldra. Uh, people say to me, where is Tintaldra? Well, if you draw a straight line from Melbourne to Sydney, it's where that straight line crosses the Murray River. Um, about uh, 80 miles as it used to be then, east of Albany Wodonga. Uh, I was born there. Uh, spent my uh, school uh, boyhood and school days. Uh, I, I, uh, there was a primary school there. I went to the primary school. I think I was seven when I uh, went to school uh, and uh, I, I had six years of education. And now when did you enlist into the AIF oh, uh, and having done that uh, how did you move to Singapore, the ship you went on right, and when yeah. did you arrive in Singapore? Well. Uh, when I left school, uh, I left school at 13. You had to um, get your merit certificate in those days uh, at 14, but I got mine at 13, uh, so I uh, asked my father if I could leave school, and he said, yes, where are you going to get a job? So uh, eventually I uh, worked on uh, as an unskilled farmhand until an um, opportunity arose in, the, in the, the local bakery to be apprenticed as a baker, which I did. Uh, when I uh, learnt as much as I could about making bread, I discovered that the pound note was the same uh, colour over in New South Wales as it was in Victoria, and I got a job in uh, in Wagga. Uh, uh, city, uh, uh, Wagga is a very beautiful city in uh, south south uh, of New South Wales. Uh, then came 1939. The war broke out on the 3rd of September. I was uh, living in a boarding house. Uh, most of the, uh, the the men living in the boarding house were Brits, and the next day they all joined up. So they said to me, "Are you going to join up?" And I said, "Oh, it'll be all over in six months." But in six months, uh, the British had been pushed out of Europe at uh, at um, oh, Dunkirk. At Dunkirk, France was poised to to fall. Uh, the, the Australian government put out a a uh, decree for all men of uh, military age to present themselves and I and hundreds of thousands of others did just that. So we were um, we joined the army and we were put into uh, um, the 8th recruit reception battalion in um, Wagga Showground where we learned to uh, stand to attention, left turn, right turn and form up and all this. Uh, uh, we were there for around about six weeks and we were taken to a camp outside Sydney called Walgrove. And here, on the 29th of July, we were formed into the 2nd 19th Battalion with uh, Lieutenant Colonel um, Duncan Maxwell uh, commanding it and uh, Lieutenant uh, MC, he was MC, Military Cross. Uh, his second in command was Lieutenant Colonel Charles Grover Wright Anderson, also Military Cross from World War I. Uh, we trained there, uh, for uh, did company training for around about uh, six weeks and then we were taken to Ingleburn. Ingleburn is the, um, the New South Wales equivalent to Puckapunyal here in Victoria. Uh, from there we went to um, Bathurst in New South Wales where we were engaged in um, uh, brigade exercises. But when we got to, um, to um, Bathurst, uh, I was selected to be to go to a, a, a runner school. Now, a runner in the uh, army is a man who um, carries the orders. In the um, in the uh, when war is on, the noise a commander can't uh, yell out to his uh, platoon commander, 
he's got to have a man to go out and give them the orders. Just for example, uh, uh, in a company there are three platoons of about 30 men. They always form one up and two back. Uh, if they strike the enemy, then the, other, the two back ones might have to go to the left or the right, and that was my job to go out and tell them to uh, to um, uh, to give them their orders. So we um, then we um, were um, taken. Uh, uh, must have been about I think it was the third of March. We were taken to number nine wharf uh, in Piermont in Sydney, and uh, we were there. We boarded the uh, uh, H. Uh, HMT, His Majesty's Transport Queen Mary. Uh, we, uh, w when we uh, boarded the ship, we were the the um, strength of a of an infantry battalion is around about a thousand. The witty ones used to say a thousand and one, the one being the chaplain. But we uh, boarded that ship. We were 946 men. We were 54 short. Uh, so we away we sailed to destination unknown. Um, we got after we were on it a couple of days. It got very cold. We were later found out that we were south of Tasmania. The uh, the ship couldn't go through the uh, through Bass Strait uh, because uh, if uh, she'd been attacked by a submarine by an enemy submarine, uh, um, she'd had no way of escape. So uh, anyhow, we got. Uh, uh, pulled in at uh, Fremantle, and I think there we took on water. Uh, we still thought we were going to the Middle East. We were, had been trained for the Middle East. In fact, when we were in uh, Bathurst, we were given half a bottle of water uh, to uh, train us to go without water. So we thought we were going. To, but when we got to um, uh, then Java, now Indonesia, the Queen Mary put on a burst of speed and uh, encircled the, the uh, convoy, and we found ourselves in. Uh, at uh, HMS Salita, that's the naval base in Singapore. Had you uh, stopped at Fremantle on the stopped way through? At, stopped at yes. Fremantle here to get, yeah. uh, and uh, I think we, I think it was just to take on water. Yes, and was the Queen Mary the only one that separated from the convoy? The yeah, only, the only one. Yes, yeah. thank you. Yeah. yeah, the others I think uh, went on to the Middle East. Yes, uh, we um, uh, went into um, the naval base at uh, Singapore. The uh, um, one of one of the uh, um, little um, uh, uh, what do I say? Uh, uh, the, the wharf was uh, guarded by uh, Sikhs, in, Indian Sikhs. So uh, we, uh, I remember, we yelled out, "What time is it?" And he looked at his watch and he said, "It's twenty hundred hours." And we, uh, we had to. Work out what twenty hundred hours was because we we hadn't yet learnt the uh, the twenty four hour uh, clock. Yes. Uh, we were uh, put on a, on a train and taken straight. Uh, they called it up country, uh, and I think it was around about two hundred again miles. They still we were still in miles then uh, to uh, Surimbin. Surimbin was the capital of um, the uh, state of. Um, ooh, Forgotten the name of the state. It uh, anyway. Doesn't matter. Uh, there we uh, we trained and we discovered that um, we're now in the tropics, and you only had to walk about 20 yards, and you were with your shirt uh, was wet with perspiration. But we trained uh, for. Uh, oh, we had to march and uh, uh, learn to do uh, jungle training. Now, never before had the British ever fought in jungle warfare. So we, uh, oh, the, uh, the, the officers of course, uh, appealed to the British for uh, uh, knowledge of uh, jungle uh, fighting and they'd never ever fought before in the jungle. So we had to work out our own um, tactics. And just as an example, um, we, uh, they realised that uh, all the, that the war would have been fought along the roads. So we used to uh, march along the e uh, edges of the road then they decided that if we were attacked, uh, they staggered us. Uh, a section this side, a section the other side, and uh, st staggered along the road. That's just one of the, uh, of the tactics that we, uh, we worked out. Uh, here we uh, stayed there, or we uh, went to, um, to um, another camp over on the, uh, on, the, on the coast, 
Uh, we were now the 22nd Brigade. We so had that, the, is that over on the east coast? On, on the west coast. On the west, west coast, coast, thank you. Uh, I can't think of the name of the place. Um, but we, we were now a brigade, the 2nd 18th, 2nd 19th and 2nd 20th battalions. Mm -hmm. uh, here we, uh, we were there from um, uh, March right round until uh, uh, or just before the war started. The, uh, the, uh, the Australian defence line was roughly a line across uh, 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 Uh We were then taken uh, by this time the 27th Brigade had arrived around about June. Uh, now um, when the 27th Brigade arrived they were the 2nd, 26th, 29th and 30th Battalions. Uh, our commanding officer uh, Colonel Maxwell was promoted Brigadier and he became the Brigadier of, of that Brigade. That made Colonel Anderson the commanding officer of 2nd, 19th Battalion. Uh, we were moved over to the east coast because uh, uh, on the east coast they, um, there were uh, very good beaches there where they anticipated the Japs would land on these beaches, but that didn't happen. Uh, we were, uh, uh, my company, Don Company of, uh, of uh, Second Island's Battalion, were, were taken to uh, taken north to uh, a town called uh, Endow. Endow was the border on this side the river was Johor, on the other side was, uh, oh, uh, oh, I've just forgotten the name, but there were nine states in uh, in uh, Malaya, Trangano I think it was called, I'm not too sure of that. Uh, here we, we uh, now the Japanese were the masters of the encircling movement. They had landed in, uh, in Thailand and uh, sent a, a force down, um, down both sides of the, of the peninsula. Uh, the main one down the west coast and on the east coast just a, a, a token amount, but there we met <coughs> on the 14th of January uh, 1942, uh, we, uh, we met them there and there we had our first casualty. Uh, that <coughs> we were there for, only there for about a, a fortnight. Uh, now I was a runner and I had to accompany the SIG or the signaller on this side of the river and we were in contact with the platoon over the river and the river was about a mile wide by um, uh, uh, lamp. Um, it, it, there were just the two of us and it was the hardest work that I think I have ever done because there had to be a pair of eyes on the sig on the other side of the river 24 hours a day. So uh, my uh, the sig was uh, Gus Halloran, Gus is still alive. Uh, Gus and I, uh, uh, Gus was a SIG, he, could, he knew the, um, the, um, the code uh, for the signals, I didn't, I was a runner. Um, but we tried doing it, doing it in four hour intervals. Um, first of all we tried two hour, one to watch it for two hours, but then we, we um, didn't get enough sleep. So then we tried four hours and I think we were doing it doing it on, at four hour intervals. Uh, I'd do four hours and then I'd wake Gus and Gus would do four hours. Uh, <coughs> but we were in a, in a house. The house uh, was the, um, I think it was the, um, um, oh, anyhow, it, it was, uh, the windows in the house had no glass in them. So we set out, up a, a chair uh, with the seat the other side and his signals would appear right in front of the, the in, in the square of the of the uh, the window. Well now uh, sitting back just looking out there that uh, that, that uh, went purple and it went yellow and it went black and seemed to change colours because you couldn't take your gaze off the sea uh, on the other side of the river. Uh, anyhow we were there for uh, we, we had our first casualties the Japanese uh, met uh, it was um, 17 platoon, Mr. Mr. John Varley's uh, um, platoon, and uh, Mr. Varley, uh, uh, you know, in World War Two, uh, lieutenants, uh, you always referred to lieutenants as Mister. Um, he uh, swam the river, uh, and for that he uh, was um, given the military cross. So, uh, I think he's still alive, John Varley. His father was Brigadier Varley, in charge of the, um, I think it was the 18th Battalion and he lost his life uh, on a uh, ship on the, on the route to Japan. Uh, so 
we were withdrawn from Indeo back to um, to um, oh, I just said that, never. Um, anyway, anyhow, no, you didn't come back to Mersing. Uh, back, yeah, back to oh, Mersing. Yeah. Uh, when we got to Mersing, the Japanese uh, had driven; uh, they had their main force down the west coast uh, because the west coast of Malaya was the um, the developed side. The, the the roads and the rail were all down that side. Um, and they got to uh, a place called Gimas. The 2nd 30th Battalion were there and they ambushed them on a, on a bridge. That was uh, Colonel uh, Blackjack Gallagher's uh, battalion uh, with heavy uh, Japanese uh, casualties. So uh, the, the Japs didn't... Uh, um, they, did, they just stopped there because they were the masters of the encircling movement. They just moved down to the south road uh, crossed the river, the Muar River at, at Muar by barge, there was no bridge, there's a bridge there now. Uh, and there they met the 2nd 29th Battalion. 2nd 29th were uh, of the other brigade and they uh, cut them to ribbons uh, because um, the Japanese had tanks and aircraft and uh, we had neither. Uh, so they then uh, brought down the 2nd 19th Battalion from uh, Mersing and we uh, were sent in to uh, assist the 2nd 29th, but um, uh, they had the 2nd 15th Field Regiment, the 4th Anti-Tank Regiment, the 2nd 19th Battalion now, and the 2nd 29th Battalion. They were the ones who fought the Battle of Moir. Uh, they gradually, gradually pushed us back and back and back until we got to a small village called Paratalon. Uh, when we got there, uh, now, an order came through that Colonel Anderson was to be made commander of the, it was called West Force. And uh, he, uh, I can remember, I had to uh, run a message for him out to uh, uh, to a group of the 2nd 29th Battalion. Uh, um, we formed a circle around this village of Parrots along. That was just, uh, um, he'd only just got this order that he was promoted to uh, command the uh, uh, West Force and he sent me out to uh, a group of 2nd 29th Battalion and in front of them were a group of 2nd 19th. Uh, when I got to the 2nd 29th Battalion I found the officer in charge there and I told him that uh, that he uh, was to, uh, uh, I had to go out and find the 2nd 19th Battalion in front of him and uh, they were to be withdrawn behind him and he was to become the front line and he complained to me about that and I said to him, sir, I uh, only carry the orders, I don't deliver them, I, said, I, I don't uh, uh, right. formulate the, uh, the orders, I said the situation is, is uh, bad, I said we're, uh, 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 these are your, uh, your orders and this is what you have to do. Uh, and he still kept complaining and I said, well you just watch me, I said because I, you are under all cover here, I said I've got to go out and and, and in full view of the enemy and find the 2nd 19th to bring them back right. and you have to give them covering fire. Uh, however, I, I, uh, I got over the, uh, the situation. Then I got back to the headquarters and um, then my company commander, uh, Major Tom Vincent, became commander of the 2nd 19th Battalion. And the moment he got that order, he, he called his Sergeant Major, Sonny Loy, uh, John Joseph Loy, uh, to make a reconnaissance of the, the, uh, the camp and come back and report to him. Now, Sonny Loy, I, I regard him as one of my heroes. He was, he'd been so shot up around the, uh, the jaws that he had to hold the top, one hand on top of his head and the other on his chin and work his mouth with his hands to get his orders out. Um, <coughs> he said to... Um, um, Major Vincent, where am I going to get uh, 10 men? He said, we've all already lost about 200. Well, he said, take Edwards. And I said, you'll need me, won't you, sir? He said, yes, he says, I'll need you. But he said, I need you over there tonight. He found a, a gap on the west side of the road of about 100 um, yards, metres now, I suppose you'd say, uh, with not a single man in it. Uh, then he said, uh, where am I going to get the rest? Well, he said, take Harrison. Now, Lynn Harrison was his, uh, his batman, and he said the same thing. He said, you'll need me, won't you, sir? He said, I want you over there tonight. 
Then he found eight others, that made the ten of us. So he led us over, uh, positioned us in this hundred, uh, in this gap of uh, about a hundred yards. Uh, now Lenny Harrison was even smaller than me, and his name, his nickname was Crow. If you didn't answer him, if you didn't call him Crow, he wouldn't answer you. So when we got, uh, were put in our positions, Crow was right on the bank of the river, then me, then the other who I didn't know the other eight. Uh, we spent the night there. Next morning, Crow said to me, uh, Edwards, can you swim? Because he said, if things get uh, tight here and uh, I've got to jump in the river, should I drown? So I crawled to where he was and he crawled to where I was and we hadn't been there for 30 seconds when a Japanese uh, tank broke through the edge of the jungle and uh, fired down that line. Now, I looked round and what was left of Crow you could have put in a plastic bucket 30 seconds before it was me. I, th I, I suddenly thought to myself, well, uh, I think I've got a guardian angel. And after all, uh, if I do go, who am I? I'm only just another soldier at any rate. So we gathered together after a bit of a lull, we waited a while, and uh, I, I suppose there'd been, been about 30 men on that side of the road, over the west side. Um, I, as I walked along these other, they're all dead, all the, uh, I sort of put my foot on them and gave them a bit of a roll with my foot, and they, oh, he's dead, he's dead, he's dead. They, they got a lot of them, except me. Um, we got to the other end, and there was another fellow there, he, uh, uh, he was the driver of, uh, of a uh, Bren gun carrier. Now a Bren gun carrier is not a tank. It's uh, got um, tracks on it, but uh, it's not a tank. It uh, doesn't have a big gun on it. Its, its role was to shift Bren guns from one position to the other which, uh, quickly. Um, and I uh, put my foot on him and I said, I think he's dead. And uh, um, another chap said, no, he's not. He said, I saw his eyes roll. So uh, we picked him up and uh, it was um, Sergeant uh, Mark Lever. Uh, the other chap that uh, said he uh, was uh, Sergeant Clary Thornton from the uh, 4th Anti-Tank Regiment. So uh, we, uh, uh, I think there were about uh, eight of us there and we decided that we would send a man over the other side of the road to headquarters to see what was going on. And he came back and he said, there's no one there, only the dead and dying and uh, go back and have another look. Uh, what they had done, they had moved upstream and they'd forded the river and got away. Uh, so we uh, were in a position then where we uh, uh, decided we would go west uh, and try and cross the river lower down and get back to Singapore. Now, in the meantime, we uh, came across a, a group of Indians. Now, there were uh, a whole brigade of Indians. They were untrained and all they did was yell out. We tried to uh, um, get them to leave us. We'd stop, they'd stop, we'd move on, they'd move on. Uh, and one poor fellow had his, uh, he was carrying his hand, one hand and the other just hanging by a few sinews. And we couldn't do anything because we couldn't speak their language and we couldn't have done anything any right. So we uh, marched along carrying uh, uh, Mark Lever. Uh, you know, you carry a soldier, uh, put your arms around his shoulders and he drags his feet. Uh, we uh, suddenly came along, uh, found a little bit of a road, and in the distance were about 30 or 40 men with those um, pith helmets. I call them tiger shooting hats, you know, the, uh, you see them on the movies. Uh, now the last information we had was that uh, there were two uh, British battalions coming to, uh, to help us, and we thought, ah, they're the British. Uh, so we, uh, instead of, we were still walking along in this, in, in this staggered uh, um, formation, so we uh, broke formation and uh, uh, walked right across the road in full view of them. <coughs> Out from the side of the road ran a Japanese officer with his sword up, and it was like a, it was like a scene out of a Gilbert and Sullivan uh, opera. Here's this Japanese uh, officer with his sword up, and there was uh, Jimmy Harrison, no relation to uh, Crow, then me, and Jimmy had a Bren gun, and he just very coolly turned the Bren gun round on this officer, and he knew that if he took another step, he'd been cut in half. Uh, so what did he do? But he just very quietly put his sword back in its scabbard, 
by this time the uh, the 20 or 30 other men were, were honest, they were Japs, they weren't British at all. So uh, uh, the sergeant uh, says, no, 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 no use of fighting, he said, they'll just do, do the lot of us. So uh, just stand up, leave your rifles on the ground and we were prisoners of war. Uh, Charles, can we? You, you've now you've just told us that you've become prisoners of war. Can you now tell us how you moved to uh, Purdue Jail, Purdue Jail, and a little bit about your existence there? Then the time frame to when you moved down to Singapore and how yep. you got there, yep. and then what conditions were like in Singapore. Well, uh, this Japanese officer. Uh, must have, uh, it was a very little known fact that the uh, Japanese soldier, the frontline soldier, carries a little calico bag on his belt with uh, barley sugar and high protein biscuits. Uh, now we had been, I suppose, uh, a month, uh, wait a minute, uh, three weeks anyway, we, we hadn't had a shave and our uniforms were tattered and torn, uh, we, we were hungry and desperately thirsty and he uh, uh, must have recognised this because we had spared his life. I, the only the only reason that I can think of that he spared we'd spared his life, and he ordered his men to give us some of their water and some of their barley sugar and biscuits. And I thought to myself, well, they're not so bad after all, are they? But uh, he then handed us over to another Japanese, and he marched us along to a um, uh, back to the road. And I don't quite know where this road was, but uh, there he lined us all up. And um, I was about, by now we, were, we had 11 men there, we picked up two or three on the way. He uh, lined us up, came along to the first one and he put his foot in front of, uh, we all, by now we had to stand to a kiotsky, Japanese attention, we uh, very quickly learnt that. Uh, they have two, uh, uh, two orders, kiotsky and yasmi, that's uh, attention and rest. Uh, so he put his foot behind uh, kick, kicked our uh, leg away and put his hand on the opposite shoulder and pushed and of course down they went. When he came to me I thought I'll oh, hang this for a joke and I uh, put all my weight onto the other foot and he went over. Oh, that was the worst thing that I could have done. He uh, got up and he uh, uh, laid into me with his rifle butt and his boots but I rolled up into a little ball and uh, no bones broken. Anyhow we were taken from there to Moa to uh, uh, to a, a playing field, and there they, uh, we learnt the first word of Japanese, that was uh, Benjo, that's the toilet. Uh, uh, and there they brought in uh, two uh, Dutch airmen, they'd been shot down in flames. One uh, uh, had to be, uh, one was very badly burnt, the other one uh, was his um, sergeant and he, uh, he, he was dragging him in. Anyhow, we spent the night there. The next night, we were taken to, back to Gimas, and we were put in a house there. Uh, it was a, a good quality house. Uh, now, by now, our tongues were just about swelling from thirst. Uh, this uh, house had a flush toilet, and uh, as well as using it for the purpose that it was designed, we flushed it, uh, how to get the water up to our mouth, so we caught the water in our cupped hands and drank it. Uh, and here we were taken into a room, uh, one by one, to be uh, uh, questioned by a Japanese officer. He spoke very good English, and when it came my turn, I went into the room and I observed that he, uh, there was a, uh, a, an armed guard on both sides of the door with his fixed bayonet, and he said to me, uh, what is your name? And I told him my name and I said, that's all I have to tell you is my name and number under the um, Geneva Convention. He said, ha but uh, Japan didn't sign the Geneva Convention, so that's out. Now he said, I want you to tell me the disposition of uh, troops. Now me being a runner, I, I knew where all the troops were and I feared that he would get it out of me where they were to their detriment. So he, he said, do you call your officer sir? I said, yes I do. Well he said, I'm an officer, and he said, I'd like you to call me sir. And I said, yes sir. Uh, now he said, I have ways and means of making you tell me the, uh, the, the, the questions I ask you. And again he said, uh, can you tell me the disposition of troops? And I uh, fobbed him off a bit, so then he called his two guards. Uh, all, all the time I'm standing at Kiotsky, 
and he called the two guards over and they put their bayonets up under their chin. And I thought to myself, well, I've got to do something in a hurry. And I looked up on the, on the wall and there was a map of Malaya. And I said, sir, I can tell you all the disposition of all the troops around the town of Sarimba. And I could see the look come over him. Ah, oh, I've got him. Now, I knew that he'd taken Sarimba ten days before. He looked up at the map, looked, found uh, Sarimba, dismissed. So uh, I got out of that one. And again, I was in fear of uh, losing my life. Um, eventually we were taken out underneath a tree uh, and there the most uh, terrible smell. Jan, uh, Jan, uh, Jan uh, the, uh, the, uh, the junior Dutchman, uh, who spoke very good English, probably better than, uh, than we because he'd been taught English, uh, and he said, gentlemen, I've shit myself. Uh, and that smell, it didn't matter what colour of your uniform or what nationality you were, everybody smelled the same. And that smell uh, hung with me for the best part of four years that I was a prisoner. Uh, then we were taken on, uh, uh, put on a bus, taken to uh, Kuala Lumpur. Uh, we went round, the, the guard uh, asked us, uh, had any of us been to Kuala Lumpur, and none of us had, so we went first of all all to the military barracks, the Department of uh, Agriculture, uh, looking for a big house. Uh, the uh, oh, two or three uh, 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 institutions where they had big buildings, and it wasn't any of them. So uh, eventually we went past the, uh, the town hall of uh, Kuala Lumpur, and uh, outside the, the town hall were a row of poles, all with a human head on them. We were told later that they were the uh, officials who wouldn't uh, 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 cooperate, or cooperate with them. Eventually we came to uh, the big house and the big house of course was Pudu Jail. Mm. Now the uh, Pudu Jail, uh, Malaya was a British colony. Uh, the, um, the British controlled the jails and uh, the Japanese on their march south had uh, committed a couple of massacres. Uh, they feared that uh, they would uh, execute all the civilian prisoners. So they opened the gates, let them all run free, and there was a ready-made prisoner of war camp. Now, Pudu Jail, uh, uh, when we entered it, uh, we, were, uh, we were around about 11, and there were a few others, so I always say I was one of the first 30, uh, probably less, but uh, so, I'm, so nobody can call me a liar, I say the first 30. Uh, but they had all the, uh, the second battalion, the Argyles and Southern Islanders from, uh, from uh, Jitra and Crow there. Uh, we were in this. Uh, we were put in the um, in the women's section of the jail, which was a, an area of about 20 metres by 20 metres. And eventually, there were 600 men in there. Um, and there, the conditions were just shocking. The, uh, uh, did I say the first word we learned of uh, is the benjo, oh. the toilet? So we uh, the feeding point was uh, about 10 metres away from the benjo, so just open to uh, to uh, the disease. We've got the map there. Would you like to orient us on the outline of Purdue Jail, Charles? Uh, now here was the, uh, the, the the jail itself was a three-storey bluestone building. Uh, it was uh, built in the, the shape of an X with an elongated centre. But it's this little area up here the, uh, that we're talking about now. This was the uh, the female uh, um, portion of the jail, and it was um, I think about 20 metres by 20 metres uh, with a bit cut off there. Uh, so we um, we were all uh, uh, in a, in a state of despair. Uh, there was no uh, no organisation, no uh, um, no order, with the exception of um, the uh, every every night uh, uh, Sergeant Major uh, McTavish from the uh, Second Battalion of the Argyles uh, called the roll. Uh, then. Uh, must have been uh, around about uh, March, about, uh, about the middle of March, in uh, into the camp uh, marched uh, Captain, uh, we always called him Roy, Reg Newton. Uh, uh, Reg Newton was a senior captain in the 2nd 19th Battalion, and within a few days he had uh, a little bit of law and order organised into, uh, into the Australians. We, uh, there were several officers there, and he uh, had uh, appointed them 
the platoon and they had to be responsible for them so he brought back a little bit of uh, order into the camp uh, and uh, he, uh, he, he was a, a mighty soldier. Uh, now after um, about 10 weeks, now they had given us absolutely nothing to, uh, well there was one little point about it, uh, uh, humour. Humour was a um, quite a, uh, a big factor in, uh, in, the, um, in the Australians. Now we, uh, uh, along here there was a skillion and we slept along this skillion sh sh shoulder to shoulder. Um, at the head of the stairs, and there were 22 steps to this stairs, at the head of the stairs was a guard and if you uh, wanted to, uh, by now we were all uh, um, inflicted with uh, diarrhoea or dysentery mm -hmm. and you had to go to the guard, bow and say Benjo. Uh, it came, came time for me to go and I bowed, said Benjo and he wouldn't let me go. Uh, and uh, I did it three times and anyhow I uh, 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 with with uh, diarrhoea and dysentery, the human body has no control over them, so I pooed my pants. Went down the stairs uh, and we had no water. We were on about a half a cup of water a day, uh, so there was no way of washing my pants. So I washed them in the, uh, washed them, I'd say, in the dirt, uh, came back and this smell uh, that I had observed when we were at this, uh, um, this house in the game house, uh, it was just, it was, the smell was terrible. So I lay down on my uh, in my bed space. Uh, I could see all the other fellows uh, aware of this smell. So I took took off my shirt, rolled my pants up in it, and lay there in my birthday suit. And the fellow opposite looked up and said, "Edwards, I know why you joined the army for the glamour of the uniform." And uh, that was the first time that I had noticed uh, um, humour in the camp. Here, here's me uh, uh, with. Uh, in my birthday suit with my dirty pants rolled up in my shirt and uh, uh, a, a, a ripple of laughter ran up and down that, uh, those uh, men lying there. Uh, after about ten weeks we, um, uh, there, were, there was a fountain over, there were two fountains in the, uh, in the camp, one here and one down there. Uh, we were still over in the, uh, in the, in the, uh, um, the women's uh, section. So we were taken through here, down through this gate, down round there, about 30 at a time. And we uh, there we were able to, uh, for the first time in about, oh I suppose about uh, uh, 10 weeks, we were able to wash our clothes and wash our bodies because by now we were lousy with fleas, body lice, um, hair, hair long, fingernails long, um, uh, about 10 weeks uh, growth of whiskers on, we must have looked a terrible lot. Uh, so we, um, then we were brought back uh, up to about here and we were all standing around there uh, in our birthday suits with, uh, with, with our pants and shirts, we'd laid them out on the grass to dry and they'd dry in half an hour. Uh, out of the main gate came um, a, um, a little uh, snappily dressed young uh, uh, British officer. He came to uh, each one of us and uh, introduced himself as uh, Captain uh, John Noel Duckworth, uh, chaplain of the Cambridgeshire Regiment. And he said he uh, had uh, had previous uh, uh, passage with uh, Australians, and he said he liked Australians. Would I? Would we each tell us about ourselves? So when he came to me, well, I said, "So there's nothing much uh, to tell." I said, uh, "We're one of the poor people of our town." And, joined up and here I am. And he then said, would there be anybody of note in your district? And I said, yes, uh, the f uh, two men, uh, the first one that comes to mind is uh, squadron leader Bill Gehring. Uh, Bill had just uh, uh, been awarded a DFC. He was on uh, flying on coastal command in Britain. Uh, the, uh, the Germans had just sunk a, a ship, um, the city of Benares, taking a, a British um, children to to Canada and for that he, he got a DFC and I said the other man, I said as a, a household word, uh, his name in um, in the district, I said he's the patron of, I said he's probably a millionaire, uh, he's the uh, patron of the uh, turf club, the cricket club, the football club, the golf club, 
and I said he's been he's the uh, uh, ski champion of a trade of Australia and the runner up in the world. Oh, he said you're talking about Tom Mitchell, my uh, classmate in Cambridge. So uh, I, I, I couldn't believe it that uh, two people uh, uh, who uh, knew each other were together in Pune Jail. Uh, now. Um, I think we we better move it along now a little bit, yes, Charles. Yes. If you can tell us how you, uh, how, when you roughly, in, how many months later you moved to Singapore, and just in general terms, what conditions were like in Singapore? Uh, well, uh, I had when I was in Pudu, I um, it was appointed a, an officer's mess orderly, and I made a lot of money. I uh, was paid. But being a, a private, I was paid 10 cents a day, so that was 70 cents a week, every week. And uh, I was, uh, uh, there were 100 officers, uh, they were all without a batman. And uh, these British officers would come to me and say, Edwards, would you wash me a shirt? Yes, sir, it's five cents. So I was, I was getting 70 cents a week pay and about two or two dollars fifty uh, a week washing shirts. So I called myself a, uh, a Pudu millionaire. Uh, when we, uh, um, it was rumoured that we were going to um, to um, to Singapore, I uh, tipped that. Uh, now we got tobacco. Uh, it was sold in a, a caddy, around about a about a kilo, I suppose. It was quite a good uh, good tobacco, locally grown leaf, chopped fine. That they would be craving for, for a cigarette in uh, in Changi, and I bought up as much as I could. Oh, I suppose about. Uh, Oh, I suppose, uh, say, six or eight uh, kilo of this tobacco. And when I got to uh, Singapore, I was right, mm. and I made about 500% uh, uh, profit on that tobacco. So mm. I had more money. Yes. Uh, now, that money stood me in very good stead. Uh, I shared everything else with my mates, but not my money. It was too hard to get. Nobody knew I had it. Uh, made a money belt and uh, never ever left my body. Uh, so we were about six weeks, uh, we went into the city and, and worked on jobs in the city there for a while, but in, in, Singap in uh, Changi I was only there for about six weeks. I didn't, uh, never got to know uh, Changi very well. Not in the jail, in the barracks. Uh, then we were got ready to um, go up to, uh, to Thailand, uh, the land of milk and honey, they, they told us. Now this is about March 1943 this is March, now, isn't it? March the third, I think it was, we took off in 1943, right. yes. Yeah. Now uh, can, I, can I just in, interrupt because, I mean, the story of the train journey is well known. Yeah. So if you can just skip that, skip over that and move us to Ban Pong and then yeah, yeah. move on. So uh, we uh, went, by, uh, went by train, uh, to, uh, and eventually landed in Bam Pong in Thailand, at the southern end of the uh, of the line. Um, we got there a little bit too early for them. We were we uh, were roaming around uh, for a week. Um, the Thais traded with us, and I realised that uh, uh, the gear I had with me was too much uh, that I'd have to carry it. Now, just as an example, I had knife, fork, and spoon, and I thought, well, I don't I think I'll need the knife and fork, so I sold those. I had a pair of pliers, which I, and I got a very good price for the pliers, uh, and I got it, I got my kit down to a, a carryable uh, um, size. But uh, all the battalions before us had all been marched up the line. But we were lucky again. We were we were trucked up to um, Tarso. Uh, from Tarso, the uh, can, can I just interrupt you there? Uh, when you had that period of doing nothing. Were you at Banpong or were you up at Gunjanaburi? Oh, we were at, at uh, well, we called it Cambury. Yes. Was told us it was Cambury. Yes. Yeah. I understand what you're saying. Now, when you moved on to Tarsau, or Tarsau, uh, do you remember anything about the route for getting there? Um, well, uh, the main thing that I remember was um, when we crossed the, um, the Mai Klong River, uh, we looked up and they were building a wooden bridge. Uh, later on they built a steel bridge, but um, the Japanese were very adept at, at, uh, at uh, crossing rivers. They would uh, they'd build a little bridge and when we were moved from uh, uh, back up to, uh, in, back in, uh, in uh, Thai, uh, uh, Malaya now, mm. uh, uh, all the bridges had been blown and they, they had erected temporary bridges and sometimes the, the Japs would be holding up the, the pillars uh, for the, the trucks to cross. Anyhow, they had this bridge just about, 
Well, I suppose about uh, two feet above the waterline on the Mike Long River, and we crossed on that. Mm. Uh, uh, and now we've got you. Uh, I'm still a runner. I'm, yes. still, I'm still runner for, for Captain Newton. Yes. Are we on again? Yes. Um, yep. I, I was still a runner for Captain Newton. Mm. I, I only had to work out on the, on the line, I suppose, about uh, three or perhaps four days in the week. The rest of the time uh, he needed me because uh, in a battalion of 32 officers, now he had uh, five. Uh, himself was commanding officer. Uh, his medical officer and his rations officer left two officers to uh, administer the whole battalion. By now we were uh, uh, we were broken up into groups of about uh, eight or six or eight hundred, and we were called a butai. Then we were we were uh, um, uh, designated alphabetically P Q R S T, and we were U. Mm. Uh, so we were U butai, and mm. we called ourselves the U butais. Yes. Um, but I only had to work about three days a week, maybe four times, uh, on the line. The rest of the time I was uh, a runner. Now, they brought down a barge of, uh, of bamboo. Now, for centuries, the, uh, the uh, Thais have been getting their bamboo. They'll send about ten or a dozen men up into the uh, bamboo country. They'll work there for probably six or eight or ten months, cutting bamboo, carry it down to the river, bind it up into a barge, then sail it down the river and um, by now Tarso was only just being built and we had to uh, unload these barges. So uh, uh, for days on end all we did was pass these uh, bamboo sticks along. Then one day I found I had a leaden feeling in the ankles, then the knees, then in the testicles. And I woke up five days later in a so-called hospital uh, I had malaria. Now uh, they had some drugs and the drugs made me go quite deaf I could, from where I was lying in the hospital, I could look out at the guard post, see the um, the uh, the bugler. He'd put the bugle up to his mouth, then uh, be there for a little while, and he'd put it down again. I realised that I was stone deaf. Mm -hmm. uh, I eventually, uh, now the hospitals were places you went to die, not to get better, but I, I got better. Was sent out on uh, on uh, light duties. Now the light duties were putting out the tools for the uh, the men on the line. Now. A, uh, a tool could be used as a weapon, so they had to be checked out and checked back in. There were five groups of, uh, of tools. I put the wrong tool on the wrong pile, and we used to jokingly say the Japanese could only count to five because they had five fingers, and they were terrible counters. When they uh, called the roll, they'd end up uh, counting on their, on their fingers. Uh -huh. um, I, I put the wrong tool, the, and the, the, the guard uh, gave me a... Uh, 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 uppercut to the stomach and down I went. Uh, <coughs> the officer in charge just went to, to my aid but the, the guard got in ahead of him and uh, marched me away and I thought to myself now he's, uh, he's going to give me an easier job, he's sorry for what he's done but that was the wrong idea. He took me down to a, another hut uh, and in one end of it were their quarters so he stood me up to Kiotsky, got back about 15 paces pulled out his sword and advanced on me uh, when he was about halfway I thought well it's not really fair because they, they could execute you uh, and that was their right they thought and uh, I thought it's not really fair of being executed uh, just because I put the wrong tool on the wrong pile and couldn't hear the order at any rate so when he got to uh, about uh, four paces away I thought well, here I am standing there at Kiyotsky. I'm going, if, if, if he's going to execute me, I'll uh, shuffle myself around and stood to a straight in attention. I thought, I'm going to, if, if, he's going to, if I'm going to die. Then he kept on coming at me. When he got to within a, about two paces, I said my prayers. And I said, uh, I can still remember what I said. Please, God, make it quick. Mm. The, uh, the last stroke, he clipped me on the lip and blood, I think I was a bit hit up, blood flowed out, he told me I was a brave man, uh, stopped the bleeding, uh, threw, threw a pair of uh, his dirty pants at me to take down to the river, the, the river Kwai, and a cake of soap, and I did that, came back and I kept the soap, so I had the, had the luxury of uh, washing with a, a cake of soap for the next fortnight, but it was one of the most dramatic moments of my life, that, and I've since discovered that if you uh, 
in times of extreme stress, everything uh, seems to go into slow motion. It seemed like an eternity. Yes. He, uh, anyway, uh, got out of that, uh, got back. Uh, uh, then we moved off to uh, North, uh, North Tar Sale. There the task was getting gravel out of the river. Uh. Charles, I wonder if you could run through with us very quickly what camps you were in whilst you remained in Thailand and then the go through the route that you went through to get to Japan. Okay, yeah. Well, from uh, we were up to Tarso. From there we moved to North Tarso, uh, where there was a, we got gravel out of the river for ballast for the line. From there we went to Tonchon. Now, at Tonchon, um, uh, Tonchon was a camp the, the British and Dutch were there, it was in, in terrible poor state. And we uh, we moved, Reg Newton got us, asked uh, Hiramatsu Sojo, the uh, camp commandant, if we could move down. And uh, we called that uh, uh, Newton's Retreat. It, it was a bit further down, on the, uh, on the, right on the river, because Tonchin itself was on the, on the rim of a canyon of, of about, oh, I suppose, thousand feet high mm. over the millions of years the river had, uh, the land had risen up I think around the river. Um, from there we moved to Tampi. Tampi was the best camp I was in then from there we moved back down to uh, uh, to uh, Tarso Spring Camp and from Tarso Spring Camp we moved up to uh, to Konyu. Uh, we were always told it was Konyu too but uh, the anti-tank called it Konyu 3, and I won't dispute that whether it's 2 or 3. There, uh, Konyu, uh, Konyu 2 was Hellfire Pass. Uh, we worked on Hellfire Pass for 42 days, and it uh, was, uh, uh, if, uh, if ever uh, when I die I go down to hell, I'll say I've been here before, it was just terrible. Uh, we're all glad to get rid of that, uh, to get, uh, um, uh, when it was finished, we were glad, because there's another, Quite a few stories about Hillfire Pass, but which we haven't time to tell you. Uh, we moved up to Hintock, and we were there for uh, about three weeks. Then we moved up to. Can Hintock. I just ask you there? It, was that Hintock Mountain Camp or Hintock no, River Camp? That was Hintock River Camp, and yeah. there was a, uh, a waterfall there. Yes. Yeah. But but was we there any? Do you, you remember? Was there any Australian doctor down there? Or? No, only 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 doc only camp uh, only doc in that was. Uh, with you all the time. We were only there for a very short while. Yes. And I know it was mud up to the ankles, and we had to build a. Uh, and there was a bridge. Uh, the bridge was already built, uh, but we had to make the uh, approach to the bridge. But we weren't there for very long, and we were taken by barge. We went up there by barge, and we were taken by barge up to Rin Tin. Yes. Now, Rin Tin uh, was the highest we ever got up. It was. Uh, uh, and there, they had a bridge, the. Uh, the um, the locos hadn't been over this bridge, and I think they uh, feared that it wasn't uh, safe. Uh, and we were standing, we went up there to uh, repair this bridge. So along one day came the loco at snail's pace, and it went onto the bridge, and it started the pile started to to uh, go down, and it quickly reversed. We had to pull pull up all those. Um, those piles on the bridge, lay sleepers underneath them, concrete them in, jack the, jack the bridge up first and then uh, concrete them in. By then, the, um, the, um, I, I, one day I saw a brass band go up and I thought, oh, well, I think the, uh, the line was finished and it was. Oh. Now our, our task there was to uh, go out to a rocky ridge, blow it, uh, drill it, blow it up and uh, break it all up into small pieces uh, and they had a, a, a little spur rail out to it, and uh, uh, there, the, well, the work, uh, when the line was finished, the work became quite easy. We, uh, but uh, two or three little uh, incidents happened there. One was uh, Hiramatsu Sojo, the uh, camp commandant, had uh, disputed with uh, had a dispute with Captain Hinder. And he demoted him to uh, to sergeant, and uh, made Frank Vega the uh, the sergeant, made him a captain. So this went on for a couple of weeks. Uh, 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 Frank Baker, um, uh, we all went. We went to the doctor just the same. But Frank ba Baker was the authority, and he uh, put them all into the kitchen. 
Uh, anyway, uh, this went on for about a fortnight, and uh, Hiramatsu had a, something wrong with his figure. He wanted uh, Captain Hinder to uh, to uh, operate on it, and uh, he said uh, sergeants aren't allowed to operate. Go to Captain Baker. So uh, the, the ro ro uh, roles were reversed twice. Yes. So from there, um, the line was finished, and uh, we were taken back down to Tempe. Yeah. Now Tempe. Did you, did you march back? Or no, no, no. We were by train. Now, yes. The, the train was, uh, and I think it was a loco we went on as well. Yeah. Uh, got down to Camp um, Tampi again. Now uh, Tampi was the, uh, the best camp that I was ever in in Thailand. Uh, it had a rocky uh, bluff behind the camp, uh, and there were two streams ran out of it. One uh, it was about six feet up the wall. It was a hole about six or eight inches in diameter, out of which flowed pure, clean, cool water that didn't have to be boiled. And on the other side of the camp, uh, uh, a similar thing and I never ever had the opportunity to see where it issued forth, but we were told that that water uh, fell on the Himalayas 10,000 years ago and flowed underground. Now in Thailand, uh, water will just emerge from under a rock, mm -hmm. uh, and this is what uh, had happened here. Now, uh, the cookhouse was on the other side, and they'd, uh, uh, the cooks had uh, got bamboo, taken the nodes out of it, and they, uh, they had running water into their kitchen. Right. Uh, now. That's interesting that because uh, some people claim that the only reticulated water was in Hintock Mountain Camp, but obviously in this camp they oh, had in, it as in, well. In, in, um, in, in Camp Tampi because they yeah. were fresh water that didn't need boiling, yes, yes. Uh, 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 running water into the kitchen, mm. and also it was a, um, a wooden water station for the trains. Now in Thailand there's no coal, so the trains, uh, the locos had to be fueled by wood. Uh, now, when we got back from Rintinda there, the task was to cut a million pieces of tie wire. Mm. Now, T-H-A-I, uh, that is not tie, <laughs> tie wire, it's the bark of a tree. Uh, they were building a camp at Tamawang for the withdrawing of the, of mm. the camps. Uh, and these, uh, they, they put up a bamboo frame, steep these, um, the, these uh, it's the bark of a tree, I think mm. it might be the... Um, Oh, what's that very light wood again? Uh, Kapok? No, um, goes from South America. Uh, anyhow, mm. uh, it's the bark of the tree. You, you, you cut the tree down and just strip these bark. bark it, it looks like uh, lace. Mm. Uh, you steep it in water, tie the bamboo structure together with it, and when it dries, it, it, uh, it shrinks. It shrinks and mm. it holds the, the building together. Mm. Uh, but uh, the British were there in the camp and uh, they um, were manning a uh, they, uh, it was a, it was a uh, wooden water station. They had a little um, tank with a petrol motor where they pumped the water up from this stream, and that uh, was the water for the locos. The um, uh, there were ten men detailed off to uh, um, uh, wood up the trains, and I was one of them. Uh, and we, uh, the, the the task was. Uh, to uh, wood up the trains. Uh, while we were there, I suppose we were there for only about six weeks. At least four times uh, the train went through, and on the back open uh, uh, open tray were w women. Mm. Uh, and of course, as soon as they got there, they liked the men. They wanted to bend you, bend you, bend you, bend you, and we all had to move over the other side and wood up the train while they used our banjo. Uh, so uh, then we were moved back down to Tamawang. When we got to Tamawang, uh, we, there were some of us still in pretty good order, and they called us the good-looking boys because we were not because we were handsome, but uh, because we had a bit of condition on us. So they took us back down to Singapore, put us on a burnt-out, rusty old ship, and it took us 70 days uh, to go to Japan. Right. And where did you land when you arrived in Japan? Uh, we uh, we arrived at Moji. Moji is the uh, the port, the, the northernmost port on the island of Kyushu. Uh, now it's uh, they've changed the name to to uh, Kita Kyushu now. That is north north uh, Kyushu, but it was M O J I Moji. From there we uh, were put on a uh, didn't know it, but it was a coal mining camp we were going to. The uh, coal barges had been over unloaded their coal, and we were put into the uh, the coal barge and taken across the uh, the Strait of. Um, Shimonosaki to uh, Ohama Daikubon Kaishu. Uh, 
uh, Ohama number no. nine prisoner of war camp, and uh, it was a coal mining uh, camp. The coal was two kilometres out underneath the sea, and uh, but uh, I uh, um, did I say I'd been a baker all my life, and yes. uh, Reg Newton uh, also insisted that uh, fifty percent of the, the about two hundred Brits there, and uh, uh, again uh, he insisted that we have. Uh, 50% of the good jobs and he called for a baker and I was the only one that stepped out and I got the best camp job in camp. Uh, I really think that had I been sent down that mine I, I wouldn't have been here today. Um, so Newton was with you at, at this camp? At, uh, Newton was my uh, uh, commanding Ground officer all the, way. all the way along except yeah. that two or three weeks before yeah. he came into PD. And did you have an Australian doctor in that camp? Or? Uh, no, we had. Uh, uh, there were two doctors in that camp. One was an American and one was a Dutchman. Uh, the American's name was Bill Plugman. The uh, Dutchman was Rene, uh, uh, almost the same name. Uh, uh, oh. mm. Now I can't think of his name, but Bill, mm -hmm. Bill Plugman was the... Uh, and how would you spell Plugman? Just as uh, uh, P-L-O-E-G-M-A-N. Right. Uh, now I'm not too sure whether which of them was Plugman, the other one was uh, uh, almost the same spelling. Thank you. Um, how yeah. much time we have? We've got uh, 25 minutes. Oh, mm. right. Uh, so I became the camp baker and uh, the, uh, the, uh, I was the second baker. The first baker was uh, Tug Wilson. If you're in the British Army and your name is Wilson, you get Tug as your nickname. And I never knew him by anything else but Tug. Uh, he always called me Charlie Boy. And he said, Charlie Boy, he said, this is the best job in camp. And if, uh, if we had to bake a little loaf, a bit bigger than a hamburger, for 400 men. Uh, he said, if we finished our work, uh, have, a, have a, a bucket of water and a scrub brush handy, and if you see one of a, a guard or a Japanese officer or even one of our own officers coming near the bakery, be down on your knees scrubbing the, the floor or the benches. Never ever let them catch you idle. And so we, we got away with it. Yes. Um, uh, we did this for, um, now I think it must have been about the middle of March, I got very sick. The right hand side of my chest swelled up and it got bigger and bigger we had these two doctors, but they weren't allowed to operate. Uh, and we uh, couldn't go out to the Japanese surgeon uh, unless we had six cases needing uh, surgery. Uh, and I think I must have been about two months with this swelling of my chest getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, one of my mates said to me, you'd, you'd make Marilyn Monroe look like a flat-chested boy. It was so big. Oh. Uh, and the pain got so bad that uh, I, I, I wished I'd die. Uh, anyhow, the day came when we had uh, had the six cases needing surgery, so out we marched to the Japanese uh, um, doctors, which was just outside the camp. Now, you've never seen a doctor's surgery like it. The examination table was in the middle of the room. All the Japanese um, locals, uh, there were, uh, oh, I suppose there were about ten or a dozen of them, all uh, on their knees around the wall. Uh, there were mums with uh, toddlers, pregnant mums, mums with babes in arms, old men with hacking coughs from the mines. But they decided to, to, uh, to take the uh, prisoners first, and me first of all. So uh, he uh, laid me on the table, put, uh, stretched me out, put a man on, e on, on each limb, and uh, I was waiting there for the needle, but he picked up a pair of uh, surgical scissors and drove it in and just cut it open. <laughs> I cried out, Jesus Christ! Uh, I think more uh, from shock than in supplication to Christ. Mm. But I heard all those Japanese uh, murmur, Christos, 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 Christos. Mm. I think they were praying for me. Mm. Anyway, well, what, what part, which part of your body? The was right that? hand side. Yes, right. There. Uh, it, uh, it, uh, later on, it, um, it, was, uh, it was called a deep-seated ulcer of the right breast. Mm. Uh, not in the lung, between mm. the. Uh, Anyhow, when, when he uh, uh, opened it up, about a cupful of pus came out of it. I didn't know whether to laugh or cry because the pain that had uh, just about been killing me for about six weeks just disappeared. Uh, and uh, either 
cry with the shock of being cut open or, or laugh with the, 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 the pain the, just disappear. The relief. Um, mm. So he bound me up, told me not to let the American doctor see it, uh, went back and lay in my bed space, uh, so relieved and I fell into a beautiful deep warm sleep. Next thing I knew I was being shaken awake. Nigger, uh, you're not allowed to say nigger now, one of the cooks had forgotten his cigarettes and he, I think he thought I'd committed suicide and he, he said, uh, what, what have you done? And I said, oh, I said, yeah, nigger, I said, I've been up to the American, the, uh, the Japanese surgeon. No. And he said, oh, look, he said, my shirt was saturated in blood, my blanket was saturated in blood. He said, I'm going to take you up to the doctor. And I said, oh, no, nigger, don't. I said, he said, not to let the American doctor see it. And he said, be buggered to you. So he picked me up, carried me up to the doctor, and the doctor said, how do you feel, Edwards? Well, I said, sir, I feel pretty good. I said, I've got no more pain. And I drifted off into the most beautiful, deep, warm sleep. He said, you know what was happening, don't you? He said, no, don't. no, sir, I said, I don't. He said, another 15 minutes, he said, you'd have been dead, you blood loss. Now, here's the question. Did he hear them praying for me mm. and sent nigger because nigger told me never before or never afterwards had he forgotten his cigarettes. So I'm, uh, or well, was it just coincidence? Yes, so, yeah, indeed. Uh, 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 it's a thing that will remain with me for the rest of the life. Whether, whether, uh, I yelled out, or, or whether he heard me cry out his name, <laughs> yes. but sent me to save me. Yes. But uh, 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 so uh, got back to work. Um, uh, uh, I was on light duties for a while. Then uh, they had a tango parade, three ranks, and we always had to count in Japanese. Itch and each and she go drop shit shut you itch. And I was uh, still pretty weak. I got into the front rank. Uh, now, at the time, at the seven, it was either Nana or Stitchy. They were changing it, I'm not too sure from which way it was now, but I said it the wrong way. The guard, uh, and we always had to belt out these numbers at the top of our voice. <coughs> the, uh, uh, the guard, do it again, and mm -hmm. I made the, oh, I lost the plot. I did the same thing again, and pulled out his sword and made it uh, and I, I don't think he knew that I'd been operated on, but he couldn't have hit me cleaner in that wound. Oh. Down I went. Uh, the doctor stopped his blood flow. But uh, anyway, got back to work. Then uh, about, uh, I think Germany, Germany was defeated in, a, in around about the end of June. Uh, by now, that allowed uh, more planes to take part in the destruction of Japan. And they were flying in from China, uh, B-29s, uh, to the uh, eastern uh, cities of Japan, they f their, their flight path was right over our camp and the RAF boys in the camp reckoned that uh, there were 81 B-29s, uh, you know, how planes fly in the groups of 333 three, three, and they reckoned they, they were, they only just guessed this because uh, whenever there was an air raid we all had to go into uh, the air raid shelters. Uh, so, the noise that those planes made, they, the whole camp used to just throb. The air seemed to shake. So then the cooking officer came down to me and said, Edwards, uh, there's no more flour left in Japan, so uh, therefore there's no more little loaves, so you're going to be made a cook. The camp commandant has uh, ordered that you be made a cook. And well, I said, sir, I can't cook. Well, he said, you're going to have to learn pretty quickly because uh, the uh, commandant uh, has ordered it, and he said he's frightened that if he if he uh, sends you down the mine, you might die. When the when the harvest comes in next year, he won't have a second baker. Well, that uh, harvest never came. But uh, so I had to become a, a, a soup cook. Now uh, there were, uh, the kitchen was blacked out because of the uh, air raids. Uh, Bert Kelly was the he was a Welshman. He was the rice cook. I was the soup cook and we had to cook a meal for 400 men at 0830 hours. At 0800 hours, Bert would have the rice cooked, had to be tipped out, weighed, then that amount divided by 400 and that was the amount that each man got and was always weighed out to him. The soup was a different matter. Anyhow, the soup, all I had to do was uh, the, the uh, 
I called it cabbage water. The cabbage was already cut up and I had to put it into these quailies they called them, mm -hmm. like a big wok, about oh, about 30 gallons I suppose. Uh, so we did this, oh, I suppose, for probably two months. Uh, one day I was standing in the uh, darkened end of the room at the other end of the room there was a door either side and Bert was standing between these two these two uh, doors. The most beautiful white light seemed to come in the two doors, met Bert's body, flowed up his body, met the top of his head and formed into a silver halo. Now uh, I thought we'd had a direct hit, I thought we were dead because I, I'd always been, been taught as a child when you see this beautiful white light you're in heaven. And here I am looking up at Bert with his halo and he wasn't a very handsome man but uh, uh, he looked beautiful. I thought he was an angel, <laughs> I thought we were in heaven. Uh -huh. Then I thought to myself, well, Bert's got his halo, I wonder did I get one? And then I thought, well, I wouldn't qualify for a halo, <laughs> some of the things I'd done. Then I thought, now again, this uh, um, um, thing about uh, under extreme stress, everything seemed to get, get, happen in a few seconds, and it <coughs> seemed like an eternity. Then I thought, well, am I dead or am I alive? And I thought, well, if I'm dead, I've got, there's no pain, no blood, no smoke, no nothing, all except this beautiful white light. And I thought, well, if I'm, if I am alive, I looked up at the clock, which was over on this side of the wall, and it was only 15 hours, and I've since learned <coughs> plus 17 seconds on the 6th of August 1945. And what was it? It was a new type of bomb the uh, Americans had just landed on the nearby city of Hiroshima. Mm -hmm. uh, Bert said to me, what did you do? Did you do it into the fuse box? I said, no. So we walked out the, uh, the northeastern door and we were hit by a wave of hot air. Then we looked up and just emerging over the horizon was this uh, odd looking mushroom shaped cloud. So how far do you, do you know how many oh, kilometres it, it, it was around about 80 kilometres, yeah. yes. Uh, yeah. But uh, World War II was over. Yes. Well, almost, <laughs> almost. <laughs> yeah. War, yeah. Uh, well, um, you had another bomb to follow yeah, that. Uh, what, ha what happened there was, and I've only found this out in recent years, mm -hmm. why did they drop the second bomb on Nagasaki? Mm -hmm. Because, uh, and I've, I've got a copy of it here, uh, about ten days before we read out the uh, execution order. If, a, if an, a, a, um, an American uh, or an Allied soldier had landed on either of the four islands of Japan, we were all to be executed. Mm -hmm. And the Japs still wanted to execute us, so mm -hmm. they uh, they put another one down on uh, on uh, Nagasaki to, to show them. That was on the 9th, uh -huh. then on the 15th they uh, uh, capitulated, uh, uh, capitulated uh -huh. absolutely. Uh -huh. So, uh, now how, so let's say that's the 15th of August. Yep. How, the, uh, uh, oh, that was the 15th of August. Yes, yeah, yeah. so that when, when the, the Emperor yep. put, put the hand up, yep. now how long was it before you started moving back to Australia? Oh, 31 days. We were in the camp for 31 days. Mm. Now, uh, that, uh, that cloud was only just starting to, dis to disperse after 31 days. Because if you uh, see a, an aeroplane riding uh, a, a side in the sky, let's say football, mm. by the time he put the last L in, the air mm. was just Breaking. about breaking up. But here, mm. it, it took 31 days. It was still, still there. Uh, then what, what was the route that you well, took uh, to come home? Uh, we came from, um, we were uh, from uh, the port of Wakayama. Now, uh, um, if we'd have been taken from uh, Ohama to Wakayama along the sea coast, we would have had to have gone through uh, Hiroshima, but they took us on a 300 mile trip r r right north round the, um, the northern coast, then down through Kyoto to, uh, to Wakayama. Mm. Uh, when, we, uh, when it came breakfast time, we came to a, a, a railway station called Totori. Uh, and a female voice said, uh, This is Tottori. We welcome you to Tottori. We have something nice for you at Tottori. And now I'll sing you a song. 
Going in slam, gliding time in the valley. <laughs> so, uh, again, uh, we thought we were going to get a, a good feed, but it was rice again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, then uh, we were taken uh, from then on. And, oh, it must have been, uh, oh, probably uh, 12 or 1 o'clock by the time we got to Wakayama. And when we got to Wakayama, a town or a city the size of Melbourne, all that was left of it was the railway station, about the size of Mitcham in, uh, in here in Victoria, and a high-rise building down on the, on the uh, waterfront. The rest of it was just one blackened sea of ash. Mm. Uh, how many died there? They didn't even bother to count them. Mm. They know that uh, uh, what 140,000 I think died at Hiroshima, but they didn't even bother to count them in Wakayama. Uh, yes. And what ship did you board? Oh, we, we boarded the um, the United States Hospital Ship uh, Consolation. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, uh, Consolation was one of the most beautiful ships I've ever been on. Uh, usually, when you go on a ship, you see uh, ropes and pulleys and rigging, but that was that was all there against the walls. But it, was, it all had uh, like behind cupboards, mm. uh, and also uh, we uh, uh, they had uh, nurses. We called them angels. They were just so beautiful mm. to us. Mm. Uh, and of course, uh, remember, we, <laughs> we hadn't seen the white woman in about four years. No. So uh, they, they were literally angels. Yes. Uh, from there, that took us down into the uh, South China Sea to um, a floating platform. And I'm told that the Americans had these floating platforms all over the Pacific. They would put supplies on them and leave them there, and uh, the next ship would pick them up. But this uh, floating platform about a hundred yards across, uh, and on the other side of it was the, um, the American uh, troop ship, uh, uh, I've forgotten the name of that, but we all piled onto that, and uh, again, uh, let's say there was a, 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 a room about 20 high that they had uh, um, canvas uh, beds of canvas, mm. and if the fella above you was a big fella, you had to squeeze your way in because when he sunk down, mm. you had. To, but you only got two meals a day on that ship. Mm. Uh, you formed a queue, and uh, you could only go past the, the food point twice a day because mm. there were that many on it. Mm. Uh, if you broke off for a, uh, a sleep, or you uh, you missed out on a meal. <coughs> uh, that took us to uh, Manila. We got to Manila and we were taken to, uh, I think it was about 14 again miles out to what I now think was Clark Field. Uh, they had a camp there and on the way uh, we were to witness the uh, preparation that they had for, for the invasion of Japan. The, the, uh, uh, they had, uh, their, their feeding system was, they called them K-rations. They had them all done up in little boxes and that was a, a man's ration for the day. Mm. And uh, I suppose we went for two or three miles with, uh, with all these boxes all piled back about two or three hundred yards. Then the next was tyres, there'd be uh, uh, jeep tyres, uh, hundreds of thousands of them. Uh, now on this 14 miles, this was all the preparation they had for the invasion of yeah, Japan. Yes. Um, so there we were uh, put before doctors, before uh, Geiger counters, uh, given out uh, decent clothes, fed, mail, news from home, and the uh, one of the things that I noticed at the time, I have a cousin, uh, Bob Chitty, Bob was playing for Carlton. <laughs> Eric Welch was the uh, the uh, commentator and they were playing uh, and, and two or three times they mentioned Bob Chitty. Mm. Uh, so uh, there we uh, were there for around about three weeks I think because um, another tornado had uh, Every day we had to strike our tents and sit on them. Mm. Uh, at night time put them back up again, but the uh, tornado never came. But the, uh, we were, then we were put on uh, HM, HMS, uh, not a, uh, uh, a Majesty ship, not a Majesty mm. Australian ship, mm. speaker. It was an escort mm. carrier. Uh -huh. Now, uh, an escort carrier, when uh, there's a big sea at battle, the planes take off from the carrier to engage the enemy, but then the, the in case the enemy uh, attack the the carrier, mm. they have these escort carriers with planes on them to defend the carrier. Mm. And she was an escort, and no planes on it, of course, mm. but in 
But uh, uh, from there, um, we went back into Sydney Harbour. When we got back into Sydney Harbour, after four and a half years, and ironically, the number nine wharf Piermont, we unloaded, and of those 946 men that boarded her four and a half years before, 738 of them had either been killed in battle or died as prisoners of war. Gee. It's so, far as Second 19th uh, suffered the most casualties. Uh, I think more even than second 29th. If you go up to Canberra now and look along the wall mm. where, where they've got all the names, I think second 19th has just slightly more than second 29th. Yes. Second, yeah, second uh, year 29th. Well, that's fantastic. Do you mind if I ask you a few questions? Oh, certainly. Yeah. Uh, would you be in a position to comment on the effectiveness of Lieutenant Colonel later Brigadier Maxwell? Because, you know, he was a doctor, wasn't he? Oh, well, um, um, uh, uh, that's right. He had, uh, he, he had one eye. Mm. He, um, when we were in training in, uh, in Ingleburn, instead of having binoculars, he had a monocular. Mm. Uh, just up to one eye. Really? Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I didn't know a great deal about him. He was a doctor in World War I. Uh, not to, yeah, I think he was a doctor, but he, he practised in uh, southern New South Wales. Mm. Um, but to me, he was just a commanding officer. Yes. Uh, I, I didn't have a great deal to do with him uh, because we were all young soldiers, all uh, uh, green, green soldiers. Yep. Now, you, when you uh, were captured and then moved up to Purdue Jail, you, I think you mentioned you had uh, Clary Thornton, uh, uh, yeah, four, so fourth anti-tank, so, yeah, you? Yeah. Now, was he? Did he command the anti-tank battery when they uh, they, uh, they knocked out quite a number of knocked, Japanese? They knocked out twelve uh, tanks. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I don't. He wouldn't have been. Uh, um, he was a sergeant. No, like he, he would have been a, a tank sergeant. Right. Yeah. Anti-tank sergeant. Anti-tank sergeant. Now, uh, it's the fourth anti-tank, not yes. the second fourth. No, I, I know, yeah. yes. Thank you. You'd, you'd have been angry if you called him the second fourth. Sure. Now, is there anything significant about him as well? Did, uh, well, did he, he get executed later? Uh, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. He, uh, he uh, was awarded the, um, the men, uh, mention of dispatches, MID. Yes. Uh, and the MID is a little rosette on the... Um, on the um, I think it's the war medal. Yes. And what about Hiramatsu himself? Can you tell us a little bit about uh, him? What uh, was his nickname? Uh, his nickname was Tiger. Uh -huh. uh, Hiramatsu um, was... Um, no, he was the, he, he was the devil. He, yeah. he, he was uh, a shocker. Well, you wanted to show us a picture yeah, of him got, there, didn't got, you? Yeah, got a picture of him here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just if we can bring it, bring it forward, nice and close. Yeah, there's Mr. Hiramatsu, who uh, Charles had contact with for quite a long time. Um, I, d I didn't really have a great deal to do with him, oh. but I know that he was a, he was a, a horror, oh. and he, uh, uh, on, on that picture, if you can see it, it's um, got, uh, well, I always say he died looking up a rope. <laughs> he was, oh, uh, did he? He, 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 and he was, he was a small man, he was only five feet six, because that, that's, uh, that's the, um, the picture of him uh, before he was uh, before he was hanged. Yes. Uh, he uh, used to poke around the camp, and every now and again he'd uh, borrow an Australian hat and poke around. Whenever a, ship, uh, a barge came in with uh, with um, boom poms, a, a tie that uh, traded uh, up and down the river, he'd. Uh, uh, poke around the barge and you'd walk up and think he was an Australian for a while, but he wasn't. Yes. Uh, but, uh, no, he was a terror. Uh, how, 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 how would you summarise his relationship with Newton? Uh, I think they got on pretty well. Um, somehow or other... Uh, now, Newton was a, a, a commanding man. Uh, he... Uh, now, just, just an instant. When we were at at uh, Tonchin Spring, uh, we had to erect tents. We were under canvas there. Now Newton had uh, got his sergeant major again, Sonny Lloyd. Sonny by now had uh, um, revived from his uh, his uh, wounds of the jaw, mm. uh, and he said, "Well, 
he said to Sonny, sight it out so that all the tents are precisely perfect. Uh, they were all ready to erect the tents. Tiger came on the scene and said to Newton, I want you to put them somewhere else. Newton said to him, you have told me that this is where the, the, uh, the, the camp is going. And then he said, Sergeant Major, erect the tents. Up the tents went, all in perfect precision lines. <laughs> Tiger stood back and looked at it, turned and walked away. <laughs> uh, Newton had won. Had a win, yeah. Uh, he, uh, and I, I'm told that, uh, I'm not too sure about this, I only know this from the grapevine, mm. that uh, uh, Tiger was a, uh, a punter and uh, he, he owed a lot of money. And, uh, and I think Newton knew this and uh, had some hold over him. Yes. Like, I'm not too sure about that though. And now what about the medical sergeant, uh, Frank Baker, uh, if he was a sergeant? Oh yes, Frank was a sergeant. He, uh -huh. was, he was in the second, uh, he was in the second 20th battalion. Uh -huh. uh, he, um, uh, as far as I know, he was uh, a very good sergeant, uh, uh, except uh, with me, I had pretty good health all the way through because I had money and I could go and buy eggs and bananas and I kept myself in pretty good order. Uh, excepting every uh, six weeks I'd get uh, malaria and when I got malaria I'd be out for five days and mm. just lost five days out of my life mm. uh, but uh, yeah Frank Baker was a, a a good sergeant and a good medical man yes yeah. well <laughs> Charles I think we've just about done it and, <laughs> and may I say how how grateful I am oh, look, Peter, to you for uh, I'm, um, giving the time. Uh, uh, the time to me is nothing. Mm. Um, um, but I brought. I went, no, that's your map. Uh, uh, have, have, have I ever given you the um, the um, execution order? No. Uh, and I, and I'll, I'll, I'll try and put it on the screen. Oh, I'll just uh, close this now. Now, you mentioned the execution order, uh, and thank you for showing it there. This is a copy of the English translation of the execution order and just to prove that there's no uh, falsification here here it is in Japanese so if you you want to query it go and take that away and get it interpreted <laughs> but I was going to also ask Charles uh, we, he did mention briefly early something about the chaplain uh, chaplain, chaplain Duckworth but I did want to know if he knew anything about an Australian by the name of Harry Thorpe and I'll just pause while Charles gets ready to tell us about that. When we were in Changi uh, getting ready to go up to, um, to Thailand, uh, Reg, uh, Roaring Reg Newton, the, the commanding officer, uh, realised that he didn't have a chaplain and there were no more chaplains left. So uh, he heard, oh, I don't know whether Harry Thorpe uh, came to him or um, Reg had heard about him, but he, he, he was not yet ordained. But he came and said to Reg Newton, I'm not yet ordained, but he said, I'm prepared to, uh, to uh, serve as your chaplain. So uh, Reg grabbed him and, and took him uh, up to, uh, to Thailand with us, and he served with distinction uh, as a chaplain in all the time we were in Thailand. Uh, after the war, he was awarded, he, he um, became a Reverend, and I think he was the vicar, Church of England vicar at I think in Dubbo in New South Wales. But he was awarded the uh, the MBE, the member of the British Empire. Mm -hmm. um, his nickname was Happy, Happy Harry. He, uh, I can remember we were at Camp Tonchin, and uh, a tree fell on one of our fellows and uh, uh, killed him. Uh, so there, there was no cemetery there, so we had to, uh, um, well, Harry had to uh, designate a, a, an area as a cemetery and I remember he, uh, uh, can remember him well this day, it was a, a windy day and he had a he had his cassock, is that a cassock, the, uh, the garment? Uh, cas cassock or surplus, yeah, the surplus yeah. is the white one. Yeah, and uh, it was a black one. Oh, black. And he uh, wandered around this, uh, this area that was designated as a cemetery with a bowl of uh, of water splashing the water around. I, I guess it was uh, he'd uh, um, blessed the water. It was uh, holy water. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, but I, I can always remember Harry as um, on that day the wind blowing his cassock, and 
that was the uh, the area that was designated as a uh, as a uh, as a cemetery. Yeah. After the war, uh, and I had a picture of him here. I thought I had. Uh, he um, he came to uh, Melbourne to a uh, prisoner of war uh, reunion in 1984, and he told me he said, "Look, he said that uh, cassock. He said they had little pockets." Sail all over it, money in, in some of them, and different things. But he said the Japs never ever, uh, they respected his, him being a, a chaplain and never ever examined his, uh, his, uh, his gear. Yeah. Did you know whether he went to Japan? No, I don't. don't no, know. That's no. fine. I, it's just that in Dunlop's diaries he mentions that he was going, going on the Japan path. Oh, all right. Yeah, no, I don't uh, know. But I haven't seen any confirmation. No, of him I, I wouldn't think he would have. Because when we left Tam at Tamwang, we were the good-looking boys, and he, he yes. wasn't. He, uh, yeah. he he stayed behind. But anyway. uh, now I don't know whether he went to Japan or not. All right. So once again, Charles, thank you very, very much.